What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear alongside Tori McElhaney and, drum and. roll please, <laughs> you actually did it. You did a what roll. did you want me to do? I thought it was just like a pause for dramatic effect, no, but I feel said, like it's better. You said drum Norway. roll. I gave you a drum that was a good, roll. That, that was a good drum roll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and that and that voice that you just heard that you don't recognize is the one of Ashton Edmonds, Woo! yes, the third and brand new member of the Falcons digital slash editorial team. Yep. He's going to be writing tons of big features for us, lots of great beat coverage. Yes, the yes. man is graduating from North freaking Western. Yes, he's a lot smarter couple more than weeks. we are. Couple more weeks, man. I think so. So uh, we have a couple big announcements on this podcast, and oh. and and the first one is the fact that. Ashton's joining us full time. We're so stoked. Tell Falcons fans kind of where you come from and uh, how you ended up here. Yeah, man. I'm from so I'm from Florida, Pensacola, Florida. Born and raised. Um, moved to Pittsburgh for a few years, and then moved back to Florida to Tallahassee, and um, did my undergrad years at Clark Atlanta. So. I'm very familiar with the Atlanta area, literally walking distance from Mercedes-Benz. So um, this is truly a full circle moment for me. Um, And just to be back here in Atlanta, you know, I grew up watching Michael Vick, Roddy White, um, you know, Matt Ryan, all of them guys. And and just to be back here in this space is truly a blessing. So I'm happy to be here, man. Yeah. And now you're you're getting ready to tell stories about Marcus Mariota and AJ Terrell. And uh, what are your first initial impressions of how this Falcons team kind of looks? And now that you've gotten a a, a chance to meet Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith and some of those guys. No, I I think this team is is really great. I think the new pieces that they added on this roster is going to be amazing. Um, It's a a relatively young team. So they have a lot of potential to grow, to build Mm -hmm. around these guys guys and um you know I think the defense is probably like one of the biggest stands out to me um especially the the secondary room with you know Casey Hayward and AJ Terrell and Richie Grant and all them guys um I think this, the defense is going to do really good this season so and uh Terry he's he's amazing <laughs> he's amazing all all of them Arthur um just the whole just the whole team man I'm, I'm you know they're really great please find the man on Twitter and Instagram at AE 11, yes. and a couple underscores Two underscores, yep. Two underscores, yep. Two. that's key. Uh, follow the man. Gosh, you've already got 300-plus followers. Man, every day, it's, like yeah, every day it's like five new followers. So On the rise. Shout out to Falcons fans, man. Yeah, man, keep it coming. And uh, something else that's super exciting that's coming down the pike Tori McElhaney is going to be co-hosting. Yes. Oh, yeah. I didn't know where you were going with this. I was like, there's nothing going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, I like to keep you in the dark. Thanks. We get to stay on our toes. But yeah. nonetheless, Fridays at midnight throughout the course of the season, Tori McElhaney, Kelly Price are going to be hosting Rise Up tonight. There's yes. tons of exclusive Falcons content. I'm staring at Tori McElhaney right now. You can't see her, but she's like, seriously, giddy with excitement. Yeah. We're all so stoked for her. Yes. Big announcement came on Good day, Atlanta. Yeah. This morning. Mm -hmm. Tell us some more about it. Yeah, I'm really excited. We are the first, I think, and only um, female led sports show. Love it. In the Atlanta market. And that is something that is very, very. It's something that I never really thought that I would do. TV was never something that I really wanted to, thought that I wanted to venture into at all. Um, But Kelly has always been someone who's very much been in my corner and she presented this opportunity to me and she's like, I think it would be great. And she's like, we're kind of breaking ground a little bit here. And that was something that was very, very near and dear to my heart. So I I think I'm really excited. I'm like 60% or 60% (laughs) excited, 40% nervous. I feel like that's a good ratio. Right. It's a great ratio. Uh (laughs) It keeps you on your toes a little bit. Like, you know, but I I am really excited. And yes, um, Friday nights at midnight, Kelly and I are going to be we're going to be doing some hot takes, which is something that Arthur Smith hates, and that's kind of why we're doing it. I like it. Right? Like, And then we're going to be going over some Falcons fits, which if y'all follow me on Instagram, y'all know, y'all know yes. how much I love a good fit session, <laughs> um, fit check, should I say. And yeah, we're also going to get into like some scheme stuff too. I mean, shoot, it's a football show. Yes. So definitely going to, I think it's going to be fun, and I'm really excited about it. So she's going to be, we're all going to be busy over the course of this football season, writing the big long form features that you like. This Falcons final whistle is going to keep rolling throughout the course of the season and the off season. You're going to be hearing and reading and seeing us quite a bit in this market. I I think it's fair to say. And uh, with lots of kind of 
hot takes, hey some yo. instant reaction. Mm -hmm. And now that we're into training camp, we're into our second week of training camp. Time wow. flies when you're having fun. And I don't know what day it is. Yeah. Like that's either. a yeah. that's a thing with training camp that I don't think many people like realize is like we actually have no idea like what day of the week it is. We have no concept of it. Right. It's uh, only because there's a literal calendar in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Scott's cheating. Don't uh, let him fool you. <laughs> That I do know that it's Tuesday because it says the word podcast on top of it. So that's my clue. So over the course of the next 25 or so minutes, we're going to break down our early impressions of the Falcons in what is a very intriguing training camp because yeah. there's so many position battles and so many new faces around here. We're going to take a look at some early camp standouts. We're obviously going to have to look at the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. but most notably the offensive line. We're also going to... Talk about a word that Arthur Smith uses a lot that sounds like coach speak, but in this case is really, really real, yeah. and that's competition. I mean, it's the the competition is fierce and is heavy, and of yeah. course we're going to end it talking about quarterbacks because you know we, we got to. We got yeah. to. Uh, it does seem essential. So, so let's just hop right into it here. Let's talk a little football and go with early impressions. Who's really stood out to you, Tori, um, over the course of this early portion of training camp? I was going to be like really off the wall and say somebody that like no one's really heard of, but then that would be wrong of me because no one has caught my eye like Kyle Pitts has. Yeah. And, and I really truly think that we are watching a we're watching a player that I think is we we always talk about Arthur Smith saying that he's always scratching the surface of what he can be in this league, and I really do think like just watching him out there right now and just kind of tearing some DBs up left and right on occasion, some linebackers up. I think that we are seeing something really special in Kyle Pitts. It's something that I think we saw in year one. That now I honestly feel like we know Kyle Pitts a lot better in year two. I I just feel like just looking at the guy that we talked to like a couple weeks into camp last year versus the guy that we talk to now, it is night and day with this guy. And he, I think he understands that he is one of the primary faces of this franchise in a year that is very, very transitional in a lot of different ways. And just seeing him out on the field and kind of being – a leader and, and seeing the physical attributes of which he has. It was funny. My dad came to practice on Monday. It was the first day of pads and coach the Mac. coach Mac. Yeah. And so the, in the first, one of the first things he says, Kyle, Kyle Pitts was working with Justin Peel, who's the tight ends coach. And he said, he's like, man, he's like, he's a specimen. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, he just look, he just, he's like, he just looks different. And it's true. I, I think a lot of people like we talk about Kyle Pitts a lot being such an important part of this offense, but to just see him go out there and do some of the physical things that he can do on the field, it's really, it's really stands out in my mind. Yeah, I think the way he carries himself, too, that there's an air of confidence that definitely isn't cocky. No. But he just has a real belief in, in himself. And his last press conference, which I thought was really good, he talked about finding his voice as a leader. Maybe not as a raw, raw guy, but just as a way to encourage those under him and I think he understands and accepts the responsibility that's coming to him he knows he's going to see double teams he knows he's going to have to produce and score more than one touchdown yep. maybe might be a good thing yeah and maybe do it on U.S. soil that's just I'm just throwing it out there right maybe Pro Bowl doesn't count no I, no it does not and I will I will throw hands with anybody <laughs> who says differently no but, I won't I'm scared but I do think though that all these things that we're talking about with Kyle um this it's it's fine to bring him up as a standout here because he looks he that looks good. It. Yes. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank he looks you. comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And Ash. that's really the, the the like key thing. And the most fun matchup, which leads to Ashton standout, is when Kyle Pitts goes up against a cornerback that Ashton just being here for the last two weeks, you're starting to see AJ Terrell. Yes. What are your thoughts kind of seeing this guy work in practice every, Man. every day? Yeah, no, nah, he, this is his third year. Um, he looks very much confident, very much comfortable in this defense. You can tell he's always in the right place at the right time. 100. Um, and you can tell he's starting to step up into that leadership role. Um, and I think, you know, Dean Pease is looking towards him to be a leader on this defense and especially in the secondary. Um, and just playing alongside Casey Hayward, that's going to develop his game tremendously. You know, Casey is a veteran in the NFL, and, you know, just playing alongside him, um, it, it's going to be amazing. So, A.J. Terrell has really been doing good, and you know, in training camp, and I'm super excited for him this season. Yeah, he just doesn't – he just doesn't make mistakes. Here's the thing about A.J. is 
I think it's you talk about him being in the right place at the right time. That was something that I thought was very evident on Tuesday's practice. It was like this there there was a play where Marcus Mariota launches the ball. I don't even know who it was, who it was to. Demir Bird. Demir Bird, yes. Yeah. And it should have been a touchdown. It should have it been, been yeah. It should have been a touchdown and AJ just comes out of the air and just barely like tips last it. Second, last like second. Last second. Barely yeah. tips it and it it may it looked like this it, it looked like the easiest play that ever was but to be able to do that like in that moment and to recognize where he is and to have like the body control to do what he did to make that play I was just like dang yeah like the he he's he's gonna get his recognition yes. this year I really do and his it. size is is amazing like he's a perfect size cornerback I think he can match mm-hmm. up against smaller receivers he can match up against really tall receivers and I think that's the edge that that AJ Toro has over a lot of people. Yeah, and he just he's he's so consistent. Yeah, never too high, too low. Always a, a tough test for Kyle Pitts and for um, somebody that I want to bring up. Despite the fact that Arthur Smith does not like complimenting rookies who haven't done anything in the in the NFL at all, I generally follow that same right. credo. Yeah. But I'm gonna go ahead and break my own rule here and talk about Drake London because over the over, over the course of this early training camp period, one. He looks physically bigger in person just standing next to him. He's a big dude. He's yeah. a tough dude. And the thing that impresses me the most is not that he doesn't drop the ball or that he's made plays downfield. He seems to have like a bag of tricks to mm. create separation. Yes. Um, he'll, he'll do a small hesitation or a hit. his footwork is precise enough where it will, it will get a defensive back to bite just enough to create space for him to make the catch. And him being consistent, I think him being dynamic in that way, is something that is really intriguing to me. First-year wide receivers, they don't all produce at the level that they will eventually. Not everybody's Justin Jefferson, right, who's going to come into the league and just do amazing. But I really think that there's a good foundation here. I don't know if he's going to have a 1,000 yards. I don't know if he's going to be get votes for Offensive Rookie of the Year, but I like – what I'm seeing now, mm-hmm. I think he's an impressive player. And you and we we talk about Pitts, right? Right. He needs somebody to take pressure off of him. Yes. And you talk about AJ, and Drake needs to go up against AJ. AJ's still winning most of those battles, yes. right? But you need him to be tested in that way. I think AJ's being tested. I think that's a good thing. I think Drake London is showing up early, and it it, it it's at least a positive sign that maybe he can show up in – September Mm -hmm. and October and be a force for this team and really fit in with the scheme as well as the Falcons think he can be. He was the first receiver off the board. How many draft Knicks were like, well, they should have taken X, Y, or Z, Garrett Wilson or Chris Olave or whomever. Literally anyone else. There are a lot of people that are like, (laughs) what in the world? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And it's like, but it makes sense for what the Falcons want and need right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Point for Tori right there. Um, but the only way that, that these guys can operate is if the line of scrimmage does its thing. hey Right? Yep. How, how about that for a transition? I loved Smooth it. Honestly. So good. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, but, but there are position battles uh, uh, across the offensive mm-hmm. line. We talk a lot about right tackle, center, left guard. Right tackle, we've seen Caleb McGarry be with the first team all the time. Jermaine Nefetti be with the second team all the time. The other two have not been that way. No. Nope. We've seen Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy rotate. They And I will say this. They are rotating daily. Like yeah. Arthur Smith made the comment on the very, very first day of practice that they wanted to get a fair assessment of those two and that they were going to be getting as equal reps as they possibly could. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, but no. They are tracking this, and they – I don't – I really believe that they are looking at it like this is Drew Dahlman's day. This is Matt Hennessy's day, and they are legit going back and forth every day. Then let's 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 talk more about that because you asked okay. Arthur Smith during his Tuesday press conference kind of what differentiates them. What was his answer there? Yeah, I asked him, you know, at some point you're going to have to make a decision as right. to who you want to be the starting center. And I was like, so what do you need to see – over the course of the next three, four weeks from both of these guys in order to make that decision come week one of the season. And he said, he was like, you know, the physical stuff obviously goes without saying. He was like, but I really want to see their command. And I thought that was really important. Like, can they command 
this offensive line? Can they help out Marcus Mariota or Desmond Ritter when they need to? And that was something that I asked both Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy about after practice. I was like, what does that look like for you? And both of them said something similar in that, like they want to be the people that others come to when they have a question about the offense. And they want to be able to command in the meeting rooms as much as they want to be able to command on the field. And I thought that was a really interesting point that Arthur Smith made about really wanting to see that command happen and how Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy are kind of enacting that in and of themselves day in and day out. And like think about how spoiled this franchise has been at that center spot. <laughs> yes. They've gone from Todd uh, McClure mm. essentially to Alex Mack. Mm. I'm not saying – you know, but there like, were some uh, missteps along the way. Right. Sure. But, yeah. but, the, but they, they've had two generational type centers mm. and they're looking for that next player. And I think intellectually center, you just have to have it. You do. Elijah Wilkinson. He's got some starting experience. He's played lots of right tackle. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, he's kind of a, like asserting himself in that spot as they try to find the front five that they can run with all yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting because when it comes to, Elijah Wilkinson and Jalen Mayfield, because that's what we essentially believe the competition to be. Right. I think that it was interesting that we have seen so much of Elijah Wilkinson. I'm not saying that I'm willing to call the left guard position now and that it's, you know, Elijah Wilkinson's spot. Can I foresee him being the starter? Absolutely at that spot. But am I willing to call it yet? Not necessarily because I, I just I, – I need to see more. And right now I think a big misconception of training camp is that we can see so much and we learn so much. And while we do learn a lot – you, I really don't think you learn as much as you do until you get to those like live preseason games, especially for the line of scrimmage. And I'm talking offensive line, and I'm talking defensive line too. Uh, and so I'm really interested to see how Elijah Wilkinson works with that collective five, wh whatever five that mm -hmm. is. Um, that's something that I'm very interested to see in the preseason games because I think right now it's a little bit like, oh, okay, like we're seeing them – you know, bump pads every now and again, but there's no live tackling right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, guys are not going 100% right now. So to get to that point, I, I'll be very, very interested to watch the offensive line, but particularly that left guard spot. And and there's going to be plenty of good opportunities for it, not only over the course of the three-game preseason slate, but they have joint practices against the Jets and the Jaguars. Um, so we're going to see some guys d uh, differentiate themselves. I still think Jermaine Effetti is going to have an impact on this line somewhere. Do he you think that we'll see him at all over the course of the next couple of weeks rotate in there with the first team? He, he hasn't at all. Not yet. At, at, at right tackle. I yeah. talked to Caleb um, on earlier Tuesday. He seems very confident in where he is physically, where, where he is mentally, and the fact that he's grown each and every year. I think he looks at this as a big year, and he doesn't look at them not picking up his fifth-year option as like a mortal insult. Mm -hmm. He seems to take it as like, yes, it's a piece of motivation, but he's not going to let that cloud his judgment or his emotions or get in the way of his work. And I think that's a really good outlook to have as he tries to really establish himself there he's going to compete like heck that's just in his nature and i think it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out the reason why i i brought up um uh jermaine is that he's played inside too so mm -hmm. i think that at some point he could factor in but we we do need to see more um you know the the, the one thing we talk about this offensive line ashton it has to get the running game going yeah a little bit yes. you know you got patterson back there like those like those two things have to work hand in hand that's true that's very true man um this offense you know matt ryan was sacked 40 times last year mm -hmm. this offensive it. line has to improve mm -hmm. you know not only in the pass passing game but in a rushing game um cordell patterson he's a he's a veteran you know and you have some young guys back there but you know i think that's gonna be a focal point going into this season is the running game i think that needs to improve drastically and, um, you know, I think that right tackle spot and the left tackle spot is, is, is going to be something that Arthur Smith is going to focus on for this offensive line. Yeah, and when you look at it across the board, right, we're, we're talking about position battles up front. There's uh, some sorting to be done in the running back room and everywhere else. Competition, 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 right? We, we keep hearing it. It's often coach speak. 
but it's kind of real mm -hmm. right at this point and we've definitely seen it play out and it's pretty in intense practices for it being this early point in in camp yeah the practice on saturday so was awesome oh so great it was <laughs> uh, without question one of the most fun practices that i feel like i have gotten a chance to watch in a long time now granted i add a little asterisk to the side because covid protocols makes things made things so difficult over the course of the last two years to like i don't know but it was so I'm trying to like accurately explain like that practice and how competitive I felt like it was because there were so many moments that really stuck out to me I know everybody's gonna everybody already knows about there were two fights and someone got kicked out blah 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 <laughs> I know I know that but outside of that it was a very competitive practice and uh there was one moment in particular where they were running um some dbs versus receivers and um, it was Drake London versus D Alford and D got J Drake just went up over him yeah. in the end zone. And it was, it was a fantastic play. It was one of those that you're like, Oh, that's why they got Drake right. London. Well then D Alford goes over to John Hoke, who's the secondary's coach and they're talking, they're talking. And then two plays later, same play, not with Drake London, but same exact play, same ball placement, same route. And D Alford goes out there and, and, knocks the ball down it was it was back and forth the whole practice but it yeah. was it was a super clean practice like it was intense but like you mm -hmm. can tell all all of the players were in the right positions everybody knew what they were doing and I think you know if this if that Falcons team or this Falcons team can go into the season with that mindset with that intensity and aggressiveness I think they can really be good mm -hmm. yeah you, you see Marcus uh, Mariota who isn't a super emotional guy he runs the ball in which they're allowing him to run in practice because they want the defense to get used to it mm -hmm. and he chucks the ball about 60 yards onto the hill <laughs> into a crowd of 2,500 people uh, if the, the the person who dove for the ball and then missed it and then didn't end up getting it back if there were some there were some Sorry people that. rolling was, down the hill yeah there were some squabbles yeah the, the ball back but, you know what someone got it <laughs> yeah but uh, I love seeing that yeah. from Marcus. There was another touchdown pass that he threw to Drake London where he gave like an uppercut. Like he was really into it. And I think that it feeds into that level of intensity that, that you need. And not only is it competition between this team, but we're also hearing a lot about low expectations, right? Mm -hmm. And those low expectations, I mean, when you have this much turnover and this much dead money, the low expectations come with it. But the coaching staff and this team want to give a giant middle finger to those expectations and I think are using it as motivation, but they also are kind of sick of hearing about it. And I think that's the that's a fine attitude to have, right? They know it exists. You can act like they don't hear it. They know that it exists. They're they're getting after they're getting asked about it all the time and they don't have any in, they don't have any interest in it i think that there's everybody talks about prove it prove it prove it mm -hmm. competition they want to go out there and compete and prove people wrong they're better than what they think whether that turns out to be the truth or, or not i i think it's definitely fueling them and they got that big chip on their shoulder for, mm -hmm. for sure yeah i mean i think it's something that we talked about when even when we were talking about this draft class and how a theme of the draft class was that they all have something to prove and they all have a chip on their shoulder and they all have a chance to go out and play, which I think is something that doesn't always happen. Um, but I think you're, you set me up perfectly to talk about what Dean Pease was talking about. And I know everybody's like, no, Tori, don't, but I'm going there. I thought his, if you haven't listened to his speech from um, over the weekend about wanting to change the mindset and the culture of defenses in Atlanta and the way that you think about defenses in Atlanta, go listen to it. I don't want to like put words in his mouth or anything like that, but just go listen to it. And I think like his sentiment about how he knows that this defense is perceived from the outside looking in and how he wants to change that. I thought was very, it was a very riveting conversation, I think overall. And it's one that, it's like, okay, yeah, like we all can say – they all can say this and everything, and I still believe that this is something that's going to be a two-, three-year transition, not just like one year. But they – no one on the field wants to hear that. No way. No – Casey Hayward doesn't – didn't come to Atlanta to lose games and to be like, oh, like you're on, you're on Atlanta's defense. Like that's not what Casey Hayward came to do. And I, I think like that's the point – 
that this coaching staff is trying to make. It's like you keep telling them, like, oh, they're bad, they're bad. Like, they'll start to believe it. Casey Hayward didn't come here to play on a bad defense. Casey Hayward came in here to lead a team and lead a secondary. So I think that is kind of where the conversation is right now. Yep, and I think Marlon Davidson, he he talked a lot about that. Um, He said he sees the headlines, he sees things on social media, but – his coaches tell him, you know, don't pay attention to those things because they could really mess up their mind. So I think everybody on defense has that mindset of, you know, just blocking out the noise and focusing on what they can control and, and improving upon that. And, um, you know, I think what DMP said in the press conference, you know, you could tell he really wanted to get that out and he really wanted to address that for a long time. So, um, man, I'm excited for this defense. Like, it's, it's so many great pieces. Um, and, you know, I, I really have a, a good feeling about what they're going to do this season. Yeah, I, I think Dean's done it a couple times now where you're right. He's clearly been thinking about something mm-hmm. beforehand, has an opportunity to, to talk about it and really takes advantage of the fact. And he just why why would you accept mediocrity? Why would mm-hmm. you accept any, anything less? Um, and I think that that's a good attitude to have as they continue to build this thing and change the culture and all that kind of stuff. Um, so much of their competitive success is going to depend upon the guys under center throwing the football. Um, going back to the first day, uh, Charles London and kind of mentioned that Marcus Mariota was the quote-unquote starter. I think he sort of meant was the starter maybe dot, 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 right now or if you were to go into the season right now um i think it is marcus mariota is mm-hmm. kind of the clear and obvious qb1 here right tori and i have been saying that for months yep now mm-hmm. that that was the expectation and i think it still is the expectation but i guess i'll just open it up Im- impressions of marcus mariota and desmond ritter and it's really just two quarterbacks throwing a lot of passes. Kind of what are the, what are everybody's thoughts about how these guys are doing um, as we progress through the summer? Yeah, I, I think, again, it goes back to I just want to see more. I think I I think that from watching them, I think they have a – we talk about the command of this center position, and Arthur Smith has talked a lot about the command of the quarterbacks, and that was something that Charles London, when we were talking to him, he was like – I want to – he was like, I want to be able to see that the install is there and they just go out and do it in right. that there is no and, if, or buts. They do it. They perform and we can see them perform. And I, I think, like, in that regard, I feel pretty confident in saying that they're at a good spot, that Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter are understanding the playbook, understanding why they're running certain things. I, I feel good about saying that. Now, I still need to see so much more from these guys because again we're not seeing a lot of like 100 percent 11 on 11 series I think today was the first day we're talking on Tuesday today was the first day that we actually got to see um, a hurry up session right like a two minute drill like today was the first day that we got to actually see that and so I think the more that I'll be able to see that the more I'll be able to give a better answer as to where I think they are and how I think they're doing. But for, for right now, I do think they have a good understanding of the scheme and what Arthur Smith wants them to do. Uh, I think there are still times when I'll watch a play and I'll think, was that a bad throw or was that a bad break? Or right. are they not as are they in working sync? On, yeah. Or are they working on something that they're not quite in sync with and yeah. they're working on new things? That, yeah. that That's why it's tough to judge over the course of a couple of practices. Yeah. When they've only had two in pads to say exactly where everybody is. I will say that I think Marcus Mariota looks very comfortable yeah. in what he's being asked to do. And I think that's a good thing for this point. Being in command... Uh, hearing some of the offensive line talk about the fact he's taking him out to dinner, he's playing golf with, with with Kyle Pitts, he's getting to know this team, he's being a good leader and all these other types of things. Um, I think all those things are important as he tries to reestablish himself as an as an NFL starter. So I feel comfortable at least saying that, mm-hmm. that, that he seems comfortable, he seems like um, a good, not a rah-rah guy, but somebody who is capable of leading this offense. You know, So um, you know how it all turns out. You know, we don't know. But TBD. Yeah. yeah, TBD. But what are your initial impressions yeah. of Ritter or uh, Mar- yeah. Mariota? Def- I want to go back to what you said earlier about when he threw the ball in the crowd. I think you could tell that Marcus Mariota is starting to feel confident, really confident, and getting to and get into his element. Um, and I think, you know, if he continues to carry that same passion, that same confidence, um, you know, he, he can be really great this season. You know, like 
there were there are some low expectations for this offense, but um, I think Marcus Mariota is is truly tunnel vision going into mm. the season, and you know in these couple of weeks of training camp, and um, I think the more he continues to learn this offense, the more he continues to learn this scheme, and um, just the pl- the pieces that are around him, he, he's I think he can be really great. Yeah, he and he was talking in his Monday press conference that he doesn't take this opportunity lightly. Yeah, he, that he understands what's at stake here. And I think he knows that time's running out to reestablish yep. yourself as a starting quarterback in this league. Yeah, th- there's definitely that that hourglass because he was he was a uh, he was a strictly a, a number two in Vegas, and that's two years. And yeah, if you don't take advantage of the next opportunity, will you get the next will, one? Yeah, will you get another one? He seems to understand the gravity of yeah. all that I think he ended up in a pretty good position to be able to take advantage of this chance so it's all going to be interesting to see and watch as we continue to march through this training camp we have a bunch more time to go and a bunch <laughs> more podcasts to yes. discuss everything that's going on welcome again Ashton joining the crew we're so excited Woo! and uh, again rate review subscribe all that fun stuff and we're going to come back and uh, talk to you again next week. Yay.